Okay, so good morning, everyone. We will start uh, today's lectures with a uh, lecture of uh, Florian Marquardt on reinforcement learning. So you can start. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. So I want to start with a recap and an overview, and then we'll turn to today's lecture. So uh, in a nutshell, as you learned uh, yesterday, reinforcement learning means to have the computer discover strategies to behave in an optimal way in an environment, an environment uh, for which we may not even have a detailed model, but that doesn't matter because we are effectively learning a model of the environment as we go along during training. And these strategies just mean having good actions in response to observations and good actions in this case means actions that when you string them together in a long sequence of actions, they will maximize some reward. And the reward is the only input you give because by setting the rewards, you define the task, you define the challenge that this agent, as we call it, has to solve. So we went through the first points here. I explained the basic setting. We went through a few examples just to illustrate the variety of different uh, settings that one can address. We went through some preliminaries. For example, I pointed out that the reward is usually delayed, which makes it hard to find the best strategy. There's greedy versus non-greedy. And there's also this distinction between model-based and model-free. Here we will de be dealing only with model-free reinforcement learning. That's the more general case. And then we started uh, to discuss one of the two big classes of reinforcement learning, which is policy gradient based approaches. Uh, we discussed the basics, especially we derived the formula that I will review in a moment. And then we went through two toy examples to illustrate how this works. Okay. So a quick recap on policy gradient. Uh, the first thing to understand is that uh, you have a stochastic policy. So the policy is really a probability distribution. Given the current state, st at time t, uh, the probability to perform an action at is given by this policy. And uh, as indicated by the subscript theta, uh, the policy actually typically depends on parameters. So the idea here is, of course, that you will be changing the policy during training to optimize your goal and uh, you do this by changing the parameters. And in the case of a policy being implemented by a neural network, and we will come to that today, uh, these parameters would be the weights and biases of the neural network. Okay, so the policy is stochastic. Also the environment is stochastic. And uh, what this leads to is a sequence like this, where you have the different states here indicated as nodes. And uh, if you're in state S0, you decide stochastically on an action. And once you have decided the action, you take it, and that takes you to another state. Again, even this step is stochastic because the environment may react differently uh, depending on some stochastic influences. Then you're in the new state, and then you perform the whole process again. You ask uh, the policy what would be the probability distribution for different actions. You pick one of those actions go into the next state and so on. So you have this sequence, a Markov chain. And so uh, if you want to calculate the probability for this whole sequence to happen, and we call the sequence of states and actions a trajectory, uh, then this probability can be written as a product because there's always the probability given by the policy to take a certain action. And then there's the transition probability describing the dynamics of the environment to go to the next state given this action. And so you string them together into a large product. And the one important thing that we understood was that the parameters of the policy really only enter the policy. They will not enter the transition probabilities of the environment. And so that will make it even possible to come up with an algorithm that is independent of any model of the environment. So we we have to assume that something like this exists, these transition probabilities for the environment, but we do not need to actually know it. We have to assume that it exists for our derivation, but we do not need to know it to carry out the algorithm. Okay. 
And so then after some algebra, we arrived at a surprisingly simple formula for how we should update our parameters during training. And so let's go through this formula again. Uh, what is important is obviously the rewards or here expressed in terms of the cumulative uh, reward that is the sum of all rewards of over all time steps. So that's uh, capital R, the return we called it. And you take this return and multiply it by a logarithmic gradient of the policy evaluated at the actions that you actually took during a given trajectory. So uh, these AT here and also the ST, they depend on the trajectory under consideration. And the R also depends on the trajectory under consideration. And then you take the product of both and take the expectation value over all possible trajectories, or maybe in reality, you just sample a few trajectories as usual. And so in a sense, this is a correlator between two parts. And uh, the effect of this is that you will update your parameters in a way that depends on what was the return. If the return is large, the update in the parameters will be large. And that means that you will preferentially increase the probabilities of those actions that you took in this particular trajectory. Now, as we said in the beginning, uh, this increases all the probabilities of all the actions you took in this particular trajectory even if uh, maybe the return was not um, as high as in other trajectories. But uh, on balance, when averaged over many trajectories, those actions that preferentially occur during the good trajectories that have a high return, they will win in this game. So they will grow faster than the others. And since probabilities are normalized, the others will actually be suppressed. Okay, so we arrived at this formula simply by saying, oh, we want to take, uh, we want to apply gradient ascent to the expected return. So dr over d theta, um, that should be our change of theta. And we know that that's the same thing you do for supervised learning for a neural network. We know that um, this should move towards higher values of r. Okay, so that's all. Now what you need to do to actually execute this policy gradient approaches, you have to go through many, many trajectories according to your current policy, look at the states, compute the actions, and so on, uh, record the R, and I will summarize it in a moment again more precisely, uh, and then uh, stochastically sample this expectation value in order to move your parameters. We went through two uh, examples. One was extremely simple. It didn't even include observations. And the other one is uh, again displayed here uh, where we had a little random walker on a line and it wants to hit a target and stay on the target as long as possible. So the observed state in this case would just be a binary, whether you are on target or not on target. And what it has to learn is obviously, if it is on target, it should stay there. If it is not yet on target, it should move in order to find the target. And so uh, what you can do in such simple cases still where you only have few states and few actions, you can make a plot like this where you plot the policy actually how the policy evolves so the policy as expressed through the probability to say stay when on target action zero when state one or to move when not on target action one given state zero and by normalization this is uh, sufficient to characterize the full policy even though there are four probabilities uh, and then you can see uh, during learning how this evolves and you see that everything moves towards the ideal strategy, which is just to move all the time until you hit the target and then you should stay. Okay, so that was a very simple example. We didn't obviously need any neural network for that. And what I want uh, to do now is uh, go further and discuss um, policy gradient uh, using a neural network. And this is the kind of approach that you would then call deep uh, reinforcement learning. If it's a deep neural network and we are flexible in <laughs> what we call deep, <laughs> at least a few hidden layers uh, would be sufficient, I guess. Um, and that becomes very powerful because uh, for several reasons. So what are the motivations for using uh, neural networks? 
So first of all, we want to be able to treat high dimensional inputs. Input here would be the state because the policy is probability of action given state. So the state becomes the input. Um, and in our simple case, the state uh, was uh, just in this uh, Walker target example, the state was just zero or one. That's very simple. We can make a table, but uh, maybe the state is the coordinate, okay? Or maybe the state is an actual image like in these Atari video games, or it could be a time series, uh, a series of uh, voltage readings and a physical measurement. Or another example of a time series, uh, not from physics, is a sentence, a string of words, or an audio signal, or you could even have a time series of images. And so all of this uh, could be the input to such a neural network. And it is clear that depending on what kind of input you're dealing with, also different types of neural networks that you probably learned about uh, are suitable, for example, for images, obviously a convolutional neural network. If it's a time series, maybe you want to try some a recurrent neural network like an LSTM, um, things like this. Okay, so these, is, these are the inputs. Uh, even the outputs could be high dimensional. The outputs are the probabilities for the different actions. Really, in this case, still enumerated as, uh, as if in a table. So the different actions, I will tell you in a moment, become the output neurons. And if you have five uh, actions, there will be five neurons. But if you play, say, a board game and there are, I don't know, 100 different positions on which you could place the next stone, uh, then this corresponds to 100 different discrete actions. And then there would be 100 different output neurons for your neural network uh, to give the 100 different probabilities of doing these actions. Um, also in physics, you could think of examples where instead of having only one action that is one, controlling one degree of freedom, like in this card pole example, just one force, you could have several different things at once. You could have a many body system and there's 100 different forces that you have to act on the different uh, particles. And in this case, also the output would be high dimensional. So why are neural networks so good in treating high dimensional inputs and outputs? That is the general story that you probably learned about. Um, in principle, if I have high dimensional inputs and outputs, it is completely impossible to go through an exhaustive set of examples. That's why I cannot use a table because for a table, I would have exponentially many table entries in such a case, even if the inputs and outputs are discrete, but uh, I have many neurons, so to speak, many bits. And so there will be exponentially many um, versions of the inputs and outputs. So it becomes completely impossible to use tables. So how do you, neural networks deal with that? Well, neural networks discover probably some underlying structure of the data. For example, in an image, they really understand, oh, it's um, this animal always has legs. And uh, it's, so there's a hierarchical structure in the data and maybe these legs are moved in different angles and so on. And I'm uh, using the processing in my layers, I'm trying to extract the structure um, and I'm making use of this hierarchical structure. And so I can get away with many, many less training examples that, than I, that, that I would otherwise need. So that's important. Using a neural network means you have to sample much, much less than if you were to use something as simple as a table. Okay. So now how does it look like concretely? We want to represent the policy, that is probability of action given state via a neural network. And what we will do is, uh, what I already said in words, we have the input uh, feeding into the input layer, could be a picture, for example. We have the different hidden layers. Now that's not a very powerful network, but I didn't want to draw that many neurons. And then you have the output layer. And as I said before, each of the discrete in this case, uh, actions would correspond to one output neuron and each output neuron would really represent the probability of taking this particular action. And of course it has to be normalized, uh, but you probably learned about uh, how to do this. So um, you would use the softmax activation function for the last output layer. So uh, that is basically a generalization of the sigmoid function. Uh, you take the, um, exponential of the, so you calculate the z, which is the linear superposition of the previous layer, 
and that you take e to the z and then you still normalize by the sum of all e to the z uh, calculated for all the output neurons so that makes uh, sure that you get something which is both positive and normalized so anyway so you get a normalized probability distribution for the actions so that's it that's the basic principle of uh, introducing neural networks in this game and so just to make it very concrete uh, we can go to our walker target example again uh, there the input was just answering the question are we on the target currently or not and so it's a binary variable zero or one we have a single input neuron in this case and uh, then the actions there are two of them to stay or to move so action zero or one if you like and so there will be two output neurons and that's it uh, of course, that's so simple that you wouldn't need a neural network, but if you like, you can represent it as a neural network. Okay, so now uh, going away from this particular case again, um, in general, how do you now really go through your uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, even possibly independently of a neural network, but uh, whenever I say that we calculate the probabilities, I will say something like we apply the neural network. So suppose you are already in a state and uh, in the present moment, you have already decided on what should be the next action. Then the first thing you do is you execute this action. And this is where the environment comes in. So either in a physical robot, of course, you physically move the robot and then whatever happens, happens. Uh, maybe it bumps against an object. <laughs> But um, if your environment is really living on a computer, like this Atari video game or so, uh, then what would happen at this step is you call the environment, telling it what action to perform, and then it does whatever it does. It's considered a black box from the point of view of this algorithm. Um, but it spits out um, the new state or the new observed state after this action has per been performed and also spits out any reward uh, that might be associated with its action in this particular state. Okay, so you executed the action, you went to the next state, you got a reward. And then, since you have the new state, you want to calculate what next action to perform. So you feed this new state as input to your neural network, it calculates all the action probabilities. And then from these probabilities, you have to sample. So that's a simple matter. You have a discrete set of probabilities. You sample which one to take, and that decides your next action. And then the whole thing starts again. So you have now the action. Uh, you evolve the environment according to this action. The environment returns what is the new observed state after the action has been executed and so on. So this is how you go through one trajectory. And then um, depending on the situation, maybe you stop after a certain number of time steps or maybe uh, the environment gives you a signal, oh, now it's finished, game over, something like this. Okay, so that's one trajectory. But now that's not yet enough. Uh, this is just going through trajectories. You want to do something, you want to apply the reinforcement learning algorithm. So once you have done this trajectory, and eventually all of this will be done in batches of trajectories and your average and so on, but once you have done this trajectory, um, you have recorded all these rewards for the individual time steps. And since you are at the end of the trajectory, now you can actually re uh, calculate the return. That is the sum of all rewards. You're at the end of the trajectory. Um, and since you have the return now, you can apply the policy gradient training approach. You have the return for this particular trajectory. And in a moment, I will say how there's a shortcut to calculate this uh, logarithmic gradients of the policy that you need. Um, and then you just update your parameters with the formula that we introduced. And then you would go to the next trajectory and so on and so on. Sorry? Okay. Can yes, I... please. Sure. So, um, because you enhance the probability at the expense of other probabilities, probably, right? Yes. So you decrease the other, like, let's say, uniformly, or there is some other way to do that? Uh, no. So... You do not explicitly need to do this. This will automatically be part of. So the, the point uh, is this. Um, we start from the assumption that pi theta is a correctly normalized probability distribution. So the way it's parameterized automatically takes care of normalization. 
So once you start to change any of these parameters in a way such that some probabilities will be enhanced, automatically the others will be suppressed. The way they will be suppressed will depend on the details of how this is parameterized. But okay, that's fine. Okay. Good. Okay. So now uh, I promised there's a little trick if you are using neural networks anyway to calculate the logarithmic gradients, but I see there's a question. Yeah, um, if I could inter interrupt quite quickly. Um, with these, with this loop of actions of ca um, calculating the probabilities, mm -hmm. that, um, for example, with that example of um, the robot walking out of the maze or, or something like this, mm -hmm. the number of steps would of course be, not, would not, wouldn't always be the same. Um, is uh, that a problem for, for optimizing the weights of, of the different? No, that's not really a problem. So, um, so you, um, what can I say there? Um, so it's not it's hmm, not really okay, a problem. Okay. Yeah, and no, I was just comparing it to to a usual usual network st structure with a different. Um, ah, okay, yeah. So so uh, you mean because some of the length of the trajectory is different, yeah. and so. Yeah, but here we have a situation where we do not feed the whole trajectory into the network. The input to the network is only the current state and it gives output probabilities for the actions, right? So the only place where, but that's a good question anyway. So here I have a sum over time steps. Yeah? And so um, what enters is all the time steps of the current trajectory, there may be more or less. Um, but this uh, network that calculates the probabilities that only acts on instantaneous states and actions. So that's why it's no problem. Okay, okay. Uh, you may have to think maybe a little bit more if you um, say if you have an agent with a memory, obviously, uh, if the uh, input is really a sequence of measurement values, let's say. Um, then if you use an LSTM, it's no problem. Um, if you decided to do it some, in some other way, let's say with a convolutional neural network, no one stops you, then maybe uh, you will, I don't know, I, I, either the input size just changes, which can happen in a convolutional neural network, or if for some other reasons you want to have a fixed input size, maybe you use some padding, you put some zeros, and things like this. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So um, let's get back to how to actually calculate these uh, logarithmic uh, gradients. Um, in principle, it's clear that we are able to do this because the policy uh, is represented as a neural network uh, and taking the derivative of that or its logarithm with respect to parameters, that's uh, something that you automatically can do um, using automatic differentiation. But there's a little trick to make it even simpler for you. So uh, again, let's start from this situation. You have a neural network representing the policy. And then it turns out that you can use um, some aspect of uh, supervised learning to, to get what you want. Uh, remember, uh, in supervised learning, if you want to learn categories or labels of images, um, then you want to compare, so to speak, the you want to compare, in a sense, the output probability distribution over labels against the correct probability distribution, which would typically just be a one at one of the labels and zero at all the other labels, right? And so one way to do this is to use as cost function the categorical cross entropy, what's called the categorical cross entropy. So um, remember what this does is simply it's a formula looking like the entropy, uh, but in the two pieces where you would have the probability, you now have the two different probability distributions. So you would have the sum over all possibilities, uh, probability distribution one times log of the probability distribution two. And um, this will be a method that if you optimize over probability distribution two, that is the one sitting inside the log, 
uh, then it will eventually try to match probability distribution one, which is the one sitting outside the log. So that's, this is how categorical cross entropy works. And so now we can make a trick. So we can say, aha, um, the probability distributions we talk about will be the following. Uh, the probability distribution that we want to optimize, the one sitting inside the log, uh, will be the policy, policy of A given S for one of the states occurring in the current trajectory, let's say, and later we will then do it for all the states in the trajectory and so on. So uh, pi of A given S, log, log of that. And the desired distribution, I claim we should set in the following manner. We should set to be equal to R, the return for the action that we did actually take in this time step and zero for all the act other actions that would be possible, but which we did not take in this time step. Um, so if we do this, I claim that if you take the gradient of this cost function with respect to the parameters of your policy, you exactly get the, the logarithmic gradient. I mean, you can see it, d over d theta of c uh, occurs something like d log pi theta over d theta. And uh, of all the sum, what remains is only the particular action that you took, which is exactly what we want. So algebraically this works out, but it also makes sense um, if, you cons if you compare it against uh, image labeling, uh, there you want to enhance the probability for the network to tell you the correct label. And here you want to enhance the probability for the network to spit out this action that you actually took, because we always want to enhance the probability of this particular action. And the reason why I took here R instead of one is that I want to move faster for higher returns, which is part of the uh, update rule of policy gradient, obviously. This is not normalized, but it doesn't matter. I mean, just uh, formally, this formula will work. Okay, and so overall, then if I do nominally supervised learning of my neural network, given this cost function, it will actually implement, implement policy gradient. So um, uh, going, going back to this, after I have calculated the return, I will look at all the states and actions I had in my trajectory. For each of them, I will set up this cost function in this way. I do a little supervised training step, gradient descent in the usual manner. I get exactly what I want. I, this is policy gradient. Okay. So are there any questions? Yeah, yes. Hi, um, just to be sure, this return is the cumulative return? Uh, yes, that's the cumulative return. That's the sum of all rewards. Okay, and then does this algorithm always converge to having the probability of some action equal to one, or could it be that we have, I don't know, 50-50 or something like that? Uh, that's a very good question. Usually at, uh, usually the best uh, policy will be deterministic, uh, but you can construct yourself cases, I guess, where it would be good to have, um, to have it stochastic. Um, let's say I do the random walker example again. Now I'm constructing this online, but let's see whether that works. So uh, let's say my uh, return will not be highest according to how far I went, but the maximum there would be n, if n is the number of time steps. But I want, the, I want it to go just by n half. Yeah? So the, the final position should be n half. This will give me the highest return. But how do I do that? I cannot do a deterministic strategy. I cannot always move to the right because then I end up at n cannot always move to the left and I end up at, at minus n. So maybe the best compromise I can do is really just uh, do uh, some probabilistic random walk still. Of course, I will be punished by still having a variance in the final, uh, final outcome, but at least on average, I go to n half. So, so there may be cases where stochastic is the best. Yeah, okay, because I was thinking also, in a, for instance, in a walk in a grid, imagine there's a treasure in a diagonal direction. So either going up and left or going left and then up would be the same. So the initial action could be 50-50 uh, or something okay. like that. Okay, uh, that's also a good uh, 
remarks. So this would be a case where, so to speak, two different policies are degenerate in a sense. Uh, I would guess that there the algorithm just uh, spontaneously collapses on one of the deterministic uh, uh, policies. Yeah? It just, just happens randomly that uh, initially there's a little bit more probability in one of them and then it wins. Okay, thank you. So um, when you were talking about the one trajectory steps, you said that when you have this policy, you sample from this policy, but like at the beginning, don't you want to like explore the ah. environment? So do you like balance exploration? Uh, yeah, exploration? okay. So I have not yet said anything about how the policy looks like in the beginning. So in the beginning, uh, you would, um, well, typically you init initialize your neural networks with random weights and biases. And um, these, in the typical weight initialization schemes, uh, it is made sure that um, you choose the variances such that the typical output is on the order of one, so to speak. And what this results in is that you have a policy that also gives a reasonably non-zero probability for all the different possible actions. And so you start from something rather stochastic in the beginning. And so you give it the chance, actually automatically give it the chance to explore everything. And then the good actions start to win. Okay, so you don't actually have to force it. Like you don't have to choose randomly some action with some probability. Uh, no, no. Really so we will see something similar happening for Q-learning where we really explicitly need this because otherwise we get stuck. Uh, but for policy gradient, if you start with some randomly initialized network, usually this is good enough. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. So now um, let's see um, one first example from quantum physics, because this is also a school about uh, applying machine learning to quantum. And um, this example is one, I will put up the link. Uh, you can also find the link in the, in the lecture notes. Um, it's an example I deliberately made uh, to show that even without using any of these frameworks that now exist, these libraries that you can use for advanced reinforcement learning, you can uh, write a relatively complete uh, quantum physics reinforcement learning example uh, you, without any library other than maybe having using something like Keras for the little neural network that gives you your policy, but even that you could skip, I guess. And it's not a very long code, so that's the point of this. Uh, what did I pick? Well, imagine just a cavity, which for me is just a harmonic oscillator. It can be driven. There's some readout. We know how to describe this uh, using the tools of quantum optics, uh, such as master equations or stochastic master equations and put output formalism. I do not now want to go through this, but this is all standard stuff that you can find in textbooks. Um, and you still have to define a goal. Your goal could be to stabilize a state. Let's say you want to stabilize Fox state number one, one photon inside the cavity. Um, and so how would this look like? How would you set it up? Uh, well, um, so first, what's your observation? What's your, what's your measurement? And again, there are many different choices, uh, but you could use something like the input-output formalism of uh, quantum optics in order to get a trace of the fluctuating electric field inside a homodyne measurement. So you look at the field coming out of the cavity, you literally measure the electric field as a function of time. There will be a lot of shot noise on top of this measurement because it's a quantum mechanical system. The noise is unavoidable. Um, and that is your measurement trace that you get out of the cavity and on which you want to base your actions. Um, and what is the action? Well, the simplest action could be that you have an external laser drive uh, which, on which you can change the amplitude in response to your observation. And so you displace the state of the cavity more or less depending on, depending on what you want to do. Um, to keep it simple here, I currently in this code, I still use discrete actions because that's also what I discussed. Uh, you, 
notice immediately, of course, that, uh, well, this would be a case where we have continuous actions, and I will say in a moment how we would do this. Uh, but um, that's not such a big concern because, um, first of all, you can discretize your, say, strength of the displacement in many little bins, so you approximate a continuous action. Uh, and secondly, if your time steps are small enough, uh, the algorithm can even do things like, um, well, just jump back and forth between two different discrete values in order to uh, approximate uh, some value in between. Okay. So how would we deal with this uh, using a neural network? We would uh, say, look at the whole input trace that's subdivided into very fine uh, time grid. And then, uh, for example, either we could use an LSTM, but here I wanted to be even simpler. So I just took the last uh, n time steps of this measurement trace and I put them into the neural network, as simple as that. Um, so it has some memory available. It does not only act in response to the current time step. And that's important in this case, because you see these measurement traces are very noisy. And if you only give the current time step, you basically have no signal on which to base your feedback. So you really want to have more time steps in order to be able to average over time de facto. Um, but you don't need to do this averaging yourself. The neural network should learn how to do this. Okay, so that's the input and goes through the neural network. I think here it may even have just been a yeah, fully connected neural network, and you get the uh, action probabilities. If you are um, not satisfied with this, maybe you want to have more actions, and that's uh, a case where it becomes apparent that uh, at some point you run out of steam using discrete actions, because now if you have any other parameter that you want to control, in this case I control the strength of the current nonlinearity in the cavity, but it doesn't really matter. Any other parameter, then of course, in the end, you end up with a grid, yeah? So you have 10 discrete actions in one parameter direction and 20 in another. And so you have already 200 discrete action combinations. And so your neural network would have 200 output norms. And this is when you need to start thinking about maybe using continuous actions in such a case. Okay, but here it still works nicely. And uh, what I show now is the outcome of this little experiment for such a simple program. Um, what is shown above is the measurement trace as a function of time. As you see, it will fluctuate stochastically as expected for such a situation with a homodyne measurement of the field coming out of the cavity. What you see in the uh, second panel is the displacement drive, uh, so how how strong is your laser amplitude at any given moment? And if you look closely, you see it jumps between discrete values. That's our choice here. Um, and the lowest panel shows what I really care about, namely the probability to find the system in Fox state number one, uh, which is, so to speak, the one I want to drive to. Um, and yeah, that also keeps fluctuating. And now I will um, show you how this evolves during training. So, well, at first it does some completely random stuff. And then I, you see here the epoch, so by which I mean the, the batch of trajectories that I'm considering. And so as the epoch number increases, uh, also the strategy becomes better and the Fox state probability becomes larger. This is not maybe easily seen on the level of individual trajectories because everything is so noisy, obviously. Um, but we will be able to see it when we, oopsie, what is this? Okay. Okay, but we will be able to see it um, when we plot everything together. So in these plots, the, the time of individual trajectories is plotted on the vertical axis in each panel and the training epoch, so the progress in training is plotted on the horizontal axis. And um, the actual quantity of interest is plotted as a color scale. So here's the displacement drive. It's, it looks very noisy. But if you look at the probability of Fox state one, um, as training progresses, you see there's really progress. So at first, it is rather low, meaning these dark colors. And at the end, uh, you can come to uh, higher probabilities of Fox state one. 
Okay, so, so the, even such a simple program already gives you first uh, encouraging results. So this is something I presented at a summer school in Lesouche in 2019, just as a toy example. And then out of that arose a research level example uh, together with some experimentalists in Lyon that is really about state preparation in a cavity, just briefly. Uh, so the general setting is this, you have a quantum system. Um, but let's say your control is very limited. You can only linearly control it. Um, and even the quantum system is just linear, like a harmonic oscillator, like a cavity mode. Uh, but we wanted to figure out what happens if you do have a nonlinear measurement, for example, a noisy measurement trace that tells you in which FOX state the cavity is in. How much of control can you have then if you do feedback control based on that? And so that's inspired by a real experiment where they can have a microwave cavity in this case uh, that is coupled to a qubit in a very fancy way and uh, driven by multiple tones of microwaves. And uh, if you then monitor the resulting, say, phase shift uh, in the different microwave uh, frequencies, you will find a signal that tells you whether the cavity is currently sitting in Fox state number one or Fox state number two and so on. And so that's very, um, it's a very interesting measurement setup. So it's obviously a nonlinear measurement. It's not just a homodyne measurement of the electric field coming uh, out of the cavity. It really tells you something about the Fox state number. And the question is, if you combine this with linear control and reinforcement learning, what can you do? And so uh, the results are quite nice. Um, what I show here is the different actions you take. Um, versus time, and the large, the uppermost panel is the is a representation of the probabilities of various Fox states color coded. So again, as a function of time, the vertical axis would be the different numbers of the Fox states. Uh, if you get a bright yellow in one of the Fox states, that just means the cavity currently is in this particular Fox state. If you get something else, um, it's maybe in a superposition or an incoherent mixture or whatever. Um, the panel below that is the drive uh, amplitude that is applied. There's real and imaginary part because there's also a phase to the drive. And what is below is also quite interesting. Um, in addition to driving um, with different amplitude as a function of time, you can also um, imagine switching on and off the me different measurement channels. So this is also possible in a setting such as this. So these are the different controls that you have available. Uh, the target will be to produce and to stabilize a certain quantum state inside the cavity. And in the example shown here, it's actually a superposition of two Fox states. And uh, what is shown in this little panel here is the Wigner density of that superposition state. And as you can see, indeed, um, just based on this nonlinear measurement and based on the driving and changing the measurement strengths in the course of time, the reinforcement learning algorithm has managed to come up with the superposition state. Of course, it's not, not perfect and it's also not always equally good. It depends a little bit on how high is the Fox state number, higher Fox states or larger distances between the two Fox states and the superposition are harder to reach because then also the evolution is faster and the measurement noise always tries to interfere with uh, producing a nice superposition, uh, but it works pretty well. And I should say this is a, this is a setting. So um, feedback control is a setting where it's relatively hard to understand a priori what you can reach. If you only talk about control without feedback, uh, then people have ways of looking at the Hamiltonian, looking at which parts in the Hamiltonian you can control and then uh, figuring out whether you have full control and can in principle reach arbitrary states or not. Uh, but I'm not aware of a general theory uh, for the case of feedback. And so that's a bit more empirical here. And reinforcement learning is re really nice because um, we don't need to know too much um, to apply it. We also compared it against a greedy, <laughs> a greedy approach that we uh, set up ourselves, uh, which always tries to displace the current state um, so as to maximize the overlap with the desired state, and that performs much worse than the reinforcement learning. Okay, so this was a quick first quantum example. 
And now a little side note. So um, you asked about continuous actions and obviously in physics examples, that's quite important, uh, but it's not very difficult to do. So um, if A is my action value, like the value of a force and it's supposed to be continuous, what people do is the following. They say, oh, let me say A equals some mu, some average mu plus some sigma, a spread, times xi, and xi will just be a normal distributed random variable. So the continuous action in each case is determined by mu and sigma, but it's not deterministic. It's still a stochastic because there's this stochastic xi. So if I now plot the probability distribution of A, it's actually this little Gaussian. Yeah? But this Gaussian is controlled by mu and sigma. And the purpose of the neural network now is not to spit out this full probability distribution, it's just to spit out the mu and the sigma. So given the input, given the observed state, spit out the mu and sigma, which then, if I plug it into the Gaussian, it gives me the probability distribution of A. I draw one particular continuous value of A at random, which means here, as you see from this formula, I just pick a xi at random and then calculate A. And this is the action that I apply. And then I can just uh, do the logarithmic gradients of the probability because uh, in the first step, uh, calculating the logarithmic gradient of a Gaussian, that's something you can do by hand. Um, and then applying the chain rule, uh, calculating the derivatives of the mu and the sigma that appeared in this Gaussian with respect to the input, uh, with respect to the parameters. That's easy because that's the usual thing uh, in automatic differentiation because that comes from the neural network. Right? So this is not so difficult. This is how, how this is done. Initially, you will have a large spread. And then uh, finally, the neural network will want to have a tendency to converge to a small spread, of course, because it figures out, yes, this is the action I really want to do. I, I don't want this stupid noise. So let, let me make the sigma small. OK, so that's continuous actions. And obviously, if you have multiple action degrees of freedom, uh, this is much better. Uh, you just have multiple mu and multiple sigma, but that's not too much. Instead of having this uh, higher dimensional table of discrete action pairs. Okay. So now, before I before I finish uh, policy gradient with the example of AlphaGo, I want to use the time to have a small aside. And that is one of the tricks you can play or one of the considerations you can come up with um, in order to improve the speed of learning. Because the formula we had, uh, well, it is gradient ascent in the return, it works unless you get stuck in a local optimum, we discussed this. Um, but whenever you do stochastic uh, gradient descent or gradient ascent, you also have to ask yourself, my sampling of the right-hand side of my update, how close is that to the average? How large is the variance? Yeah? If I only sample a few trajectories in our case of reinforcement learning, will I get a good? estimator of the average update that I should actually take? Or is it a really very noisy estimator and that I want to avoid, obviously? OK, so here's, uh, here's our little update rule again. Um, and now uh, for this little discussion, let me introduce an abbreviation, the logarithmic uh, uh, gradients I will call capital G. And to make it really explicit, uh, now I distinguish. So, so previously, uh, when I say theta, of course, I mean the sum of all weights and biases. So theta is really a vector. And now I explicitly display the subscript theta k. So theta k is really literally one of the parameters that I care about. Okay. So this is the gradient. Um, and so if I write it like this, dr over d theta k is just the expectation value of r, the return times gk. 
And the challenge is now that the fluctuations of this estimate on the right hand side, the expectation value, that's fine, that is the correct formula. But if I estimate it by only a few trajectories, the fluctuations can be huge. And so there's a little trick you can play. You can take the return and you can subtract a constant B, it's called the baseline, okay, some offset. And it turns out that if you do this, the expectation value on the right hand side is exactly the same as before. So on average, you haven't changed anything You still get the correct result. But the trick will be that possibly you have reduced the variance. So let's see how this works. So the if I take the expectation value of this and want to prove it's the same as if you drop the B, then I better show that the expectation value of G alone would be zero. And you can go through a, a small calculation and you figure out that by normalization of the probabilities, this is actually true. Okay, so it's always allowed to introduce this constant B. And now we hope to be able to choose the B in such a smart way so as to reduce the variance. So roughly speaking, if you showed this to me without any prior knowledge, I would guess I have to take B equal to the expectation value of R, right? That sounds about... <laughs> what I should subtract in order to reduce uh, the variance. This will not be quite the correct result actually, uh, but uh, it goes in the, the intuitive thinking is still okay. Okay, so um, let me just define this R uh, minus baseline times GK. I, I, I don't remember why I, oh yeah. So the baseline can even be K dependent. Yeah? So, R minus BK times GK. So whatever we have in the expectation value that I will call XK, I want to minimize its variance. I can just do this by <laughs> while doing gradient descent again by hand, uh, taking the derivative with respect to B, setting it to zero. And going through the calculation, I will find the what is the optimal baseline, what is called the optimal baseline. As you see, it's not quite the expectation value of the return, that what we guessed but it's uh, rather the expectation value of the return weighted by the squares of these uh, gradients. Okay, so uh, anyway, so this is the optimal baseline and that uh, will reduce the variance the most. Uh, so that will make your noise in the estimate best. And so we can uh, look at this in the random Walker toy example. If I plot not the evolution of the probability according to the average update rule, but still uh, using individual trajectories to estimate my expectation value on the right-hand side, you see that I can get rather strong fluctuations. So these are three learning attempts, always starting from the same initial state. So 50% probability up or down. Um, and I see very strong fluctuations. The red curve converges rather rapidly, the green curve has this dip uh, at late times and only converges uh, much later. And so um, what I then can calculate in this very nice uh, toy example is I can calculate analytically, not only what's the average uh, update on the right-hand side. We saw this blue curve before that told us that uh, if the probability of going up and down is just 50-50, then the update strength, the learning signal is largest, as we discussed. So uh, I'm not looking only at this average update, but I'd, I'm also now looking at the variance of the right-hand side. This is what we're interested in, the variance over different trajectories. And what I see is rather large variance, and you can even quantitatively figure out how this scales with the length of the trajectory, and you see it's quite unfavorable. So this uh, variance uh, that you get uh, will become uh, for long trajectory is much, much larger than the average itself. So it's really bad. And uh, the only way to counteract this at that point without this optimal baseline thing would be to use really large batches of many, many trajectories. Then of course you can always average away any of this noise. Okay, but now you can uh, implement the optimal baseline and uh, can actually work it out analytically in this particular case. Um, and you will find uh, the red line here for the variance, so it's much reduced versus the other case, and also the scaling is, is now good because it scales like n to the first power, so the same as the average. And then if you want to reduce the noise further, you can really just do the batch average. Okay, so this is uh, just an example of uh, things that you can play 
And I want to remark one thing further. This B, you can also make state dependent. Yeah? This doesn't change things because um, uh, if you want to decide on the next action, given the current state, the state is already fixed. And um, so from this point of view, B that is state dependent will also just be like a constant that you subtract in this case. And we will see later that this can become important. So to have a state dependent baseline. Okay. So I think that would be a good time uh, for a break, but a, a there question. can be a question. Yes, um, do you maybe have like a, an intuitive image of why exactly this baseline, like simply subtracting constant from the reward or from the return has such an influence because like I have, I can absolutely not imagine, imagine it right now. Like I, like if I would go through the math, maybe I would see it, but I have like absolutely no, like if you would have just shown it to me, I would have said, okay, this just changes absolutely nothing. Uh, okay. Um, well, the point is this. On average, it does change nothing. So on average, you are correct. But um, the, the tricky point is this G ob obviously also fluctuates. Yeah? So even if I just consider this last term baseline, which is constant times G, the average of that is zero. So that's why I, I can subtract it uh, without penalty. Uh, but it has a large variance. Yeah? So uh, suddenly I... Um, I mean, isn't it kind of obvious that I can have situations where um, the average of some right-hand side stochastic equation is exactly zero, but depending on which formula I take for the right-hand side, I get a larger or smaller variance. That at least seems intuitively plausible, right? Yeah. And so I can construct easily situations where the uh, so in, in, the, in the context of statistics, uh, what we are dealing here with are estimators. So we, so we have something where we know the average that we want, right? Uh, but uh, we are looking at a quantity that we will average only over a few samples in order to get an estimate of this overall average over infinitely many trajectories. And um, the first thing we want to have is an unbiased estimator. So this quantity, if I averaging over a few samples, at least on average, it will be equal to the correct value. That, that is always true, regardless of whether I have a baseline or I don't have a baseline. But then there's the additional consideration we can always place, whether our estimator has a large noise or a small noise uh, during the sampling. And I think that um, makes some intuitive sense, doesn't it? Mm. I okay. don't know, like not, not I, I, I don't really see it right now, but it's okay. Maybe I'm okay. just gonna um, with some other point. Well, how can I make a good example for this? Okay, like maybe, maybe it's just, maybe it's just me. I'm just maybe gonna. No, no. Um, um, but you see, at, at least you see the starting point, and you see where we want to go. Yes. Um, yes, please. Maybe a comment on this. I, I think I have a nice, uh, easy way to say this. So yes. imagine your average of the quantity you want to show is one. And uh, now you have two different ones, when one with a small variance, where the values fluctuate randomly between, like, say, say 0 0.5 and 1.5. Like, if you draw some samples, you're going to be close to one anyway. But now you have a different one, which, which fluctuates from, let's say, um, minus 10 to plus 11. And if you draw the same number of samples, you might be much further from the correct result you want. So you need much more samples to get the same kind of result. Okay, 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 that makes sense. So basically, uh, like what you're doing is just like reducing the numbers. The number of- Like the, reducing the, the total absolute value basically of everything to have a, a smaller variance with the same uh, estimate. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Oh, I sorry. <laughs> I have like a, a second uh, question mm -hmm. to this directly. Um, could you also uh, apply this somehow to 
um, like the same issue just with uh, supervised learning, where you would also have like some variants if you would train like an ensemble of models. Um, okay, good question. Uh, there, I don't have the same structure, of course. There, I directly calculate the derivative of my cost function, and that's it, so to speak. Um, I wonder whether that, um, I don't know, I wonder whether that could occur in cases where you allow yourself to change different cost functions. You know, you could have two different situations uh, where the, the optimum of the cost function is actually the same, yeah, the same parameter values, um, but the um, fluctuations when you do stochastic gradient descent are different. Um, I mean, just, just very simply speaking, I guess if I, uh, I could have a situation where in one case, the cost function is my usual parabola of the mean squared error. In the other case, it's maybe still a parabola in the vicinity of the, of the optimal point somehow, but then uh, I cut it off somehow uh, to, and that should reduce probably the fluctuations. Um, so I will still go to the same fixed point, but I have uh, successfully reduced my fluctuations in my estimates. I could guess that such situations occur, but it's not the same structure to start with, right? Here we had this particular structure that on the right-hand side, there are these two pieces um, and the, the, the second piece fluctuates very strongly. So it depends very much whether you shift around uh, the offset of the first piece. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess uh, break, uh, 10 minutes as usual. Okay. Yeah, let's have a 10 minute break. So 15, 15 past.
Okay, so now we continue the second part. Okay, good, welcome back. Um, I now want to go through a very nice example that maybe some of you have seen already or heard of, uh, which is playing board games using, um, using reinforcement learning. So the starting point was this, that um, you know that chess already is played uh, quite some time on a superhuman level by algorithms. Um, but among the major board games, there's the particular board game of Go, which has extremely simple rules, but it has a very large board and you simply have many, many moves. And so the number of moves is so much larger than the number of moves in chess uh, that it had not yet been possible to write an algorithm that is able to beat the best human players. And so this is where reinforcement learning came in. Um, this resulting algorithm was called AlphaGo. Um, it's by DeepMind, uh, same company that brought out the Atari video games reinforcement learning. And I will now describe just some facets of uh, what they did as it relates to what we had discussed. And there's more to it, of course. Um, I'm right here discussing the very first version of the AlphaGo algorithm. And that uh, had two stages. Uh, in the first supervised stage, it learned from a human expert uh, player moves out of a database. And in a second stage, it did reinforcement learning. And I even want to discuss this first stage, even though it's just supervised learning, because if you look at the way the update looks like, <laughs> it's very close to reinforcement learning. It's actually what you get if you apply this categorical cross entropy so you have the uh, policy P of A given S, action given state. Sigma is what we call theta, the parameter. And you update the parameter according to the uh, gradient of the logarithm, uh, where the A given here is actually the move that the expert player has taken for this particular board state S. Okay, so this was trained first uh, to give you a starting point for the policy. And then on top of that, they applied policy gradient. So um, what you see here is in a slightly different notation, exactly our uh, policy gradient update rule. Z is the, what we call the return. In this case, it's actually just plus one for winning at the end, zero for a draw and minus one. Actually, there is no draw. So plus one for winning and minus one for losing in this case. Um, and the update is the one shown here, uh, which is exactly uh, what we have learned uh, so far. So there would be a sum over all times, but this is understood here. Um, so for each step in the game, uh, you do this update. And so what they did then was quite uh, funny. So they had this original policy that was trained on the expert moves. And then they um, let the computer play against itself two versions of the computer using the same policy playing against itself. And eventually they played always, they improved uh, one of the policies while keeping the other policy of the opponent fixed for some time. And then uh, you can go on from this new policy and improve further. And the good thing is there, you don't need uh, any expert uh, um, player to play against. Uh, so this works very nicely. Uh, just, uh, to clarify things, how the policy network really looks like, what you want to have is the probability for placing a stone somewhere on the board. Uh, so this is P of A given S. Uh, and you can do this actually, that's very, a very nice feature here, using a convolutional neural network because the input, the state is just the whole board. And the output is again, an action probability distribution over the whole board. And so wherever these uh, green bars are biggest, that means the probability assigned by this particular neural network for this particular input state is biggest. So if you then sample where to place the next stone, it will probably land in one of these spots. Okay. 
So this is it. So this is a very convincing demonstration of policy gradient. Uh, I'm skipping a little bit uh, of the story. So they uh, also had another method that they then combined, which is called Monte Carlo tree search. So this is basically uh, planning ahead, trying to go through different possible moves, but not going exhaustively through all the moves because that's impossible. That's the starting point of the whole thing that this is impossible. But Monte Carlo tree search reveals that you stochastically uh, go towards more preferential or more promising paths uh, through this tree. And which ones you choose is then all again uh, decided by what your neural network tells you. So it's a bit of a hybrid approach. It's a bit specialized to this kind of uh, board game, uh, but essentially it's a nice version of policy gradient. And then um, something even more amazing was observed when they updated their program so as not to start from uh, learning from uh, expert players. So what is shown here is a measure of the, uh, of the performance of the program um, as a function of the training time in hours. Of course, this doesn't tell you very much. Uh, I can assure you that they have a lot of computing resources. Um, and what they show here is several things. So the purple curve is just training on the expert moves. And so it reaches a certain performance level eventually, which is the flat part here. The um, dashed line is when they added on top of that the reinforcement learning with the self-play against itself. So that was their first uh, AlphaGo, which was already uh, able to beat uh, human expert players. And then the uh, full blue line is when you start from zero, from no knowledge whatsoever, you, you don't have any uh, expert players to learn from. That means you start at a much, much lower performance level. Eventually, you seem to reach the desk line, which was what you had reached in the original version when you combine expert uh, uh, supervised learning and reinforcement learning. But then you see this jump, and suddenly it becomes quite dramatically better than the previous version. And so the way to interpret this is a little bit that because it had never seen what the experts do, it had to self, it had to teach itself everything like an autodidact. And because of that, as you can see in many such cases, also in history with scientists, it eventually became really much better and more creative than if it had learned initially from expert players. So this is, can, you can also view this as a case where it got, so to speak, if it starts to learn from expert players, it gets stuck in a certain optimum. But if it does not learn from expert players, but really from scratch, it somehow overcomes this and uh, goes to a much better performance. And so uh, there are interesting quotes of these uh, Go masters uh, that state that um, they were themselves really impressed by the creativity that the computer displayed here. And if you go to the paper, they really analyze some moves where the experts would say, oh, this is a very strange move. Okay, good. So that was a very impressive example that had a lot of press also. Now uh, that part finishes the policy gradient. And I now want to switch to the one big other domain of uh, reinforcement learning methods, which is Q-learning, which is also extremely interesting. So just a different approach. Um, the basic thing is that you introduce a quality function that depends both on the state and an action that you could take in the state. And its purpose is to predict the expected future return, expected here in the sense of average over all possibilities, expected future return for a given state S and a given action A. So if you had this magic quantity, so to speak, uh, then the policy seems pretty obvious. If you want to have the best overall return in the end, you should uh, look at this little table Q of S comma A, the state is fixed, that's the state you're currently in, and you should just choose the action whichever gives the biggest Q. So that's the policy. So once this Q is known, the policy is completely deterministic and it's completely simple. Always look at your little table Q of S comma A, pick the action that gives you the biggest, biggest, Q, uh, biggest Q. Okay, 
So this was invented around the same time as the policy gradient method. Uh, the question is now, of course, how do you get this Q? And before we go there, just to illustrate things intuitively, um, here again, our little game, a robot moving around the field, there are boxes, maybe it wants to pick up these boxes or whatever. Uh, let's pretend that there, it gets a big reward whenever it stands on a field with a box. And if it keeps standing on this field, it just accumulates reward. That's the simplest case, yeah? not even picking up the box. And uh, one thing we can ask about, which is not yet quite the Q function, is uh, what's the value of a state? So uh, if you are on a state and you keep doing your policy, your optimal policy, what's the expectation value of the return or of the future return given this state? So that's the definition of the so-called value function. And I've tried to indicate the value function here by color. Obviously, if you are already sitting on the box, that's the highest value because now you're accumulating reward all the time. You just need to stand there. If you're a little bit further away, then you have a lesser expected return simply because you need a few steps to reach the box. So that's the value of a state. So it's a very simple concept, makes a lot of sense. What's the Q function? The Q function has this additional action in there. So you are in a state and you imagine that you take a particular action and then what's the expected return? And uh, if I want to display this in colors as well, of course, I um, have to pick a particular action. So the state is still the location on the, the map, but the uh, action, I could take one of four actions here, take the action of going up, and then I plot Q of S comma A. So A is fixed, uh, S varies over the map. And then of course, if you go up as the next action, you get the biggest expected return if you're currently in this state, just one below the box, because then if you go up, you reach the box. So that's, uh, that's the, where the quality is largest. And also, um, if I were to plot the quality function for different actions in this particular state, they would be lower, because if I go to the left or the right or down, of course, I do not reach the box, so the expected return is lower. So definitely, if I then pick the action with the largest Q, I will go up as expected. OK. So that's nice if you know the quality function. But how do you get the quality function? That's the bottleneck in the whole game. So uh, to make things really clear, quality function of S and A is the expected uh, future return given S and A. Um, and again, in this game, we may introduce a discount. So we say the. Uh, Discounted future return is summing up all the future rewards times uh, an exponentially decaying function. We discussed this before, but the question is how do we obtain Q? And the um, interesting concept or the interesting idea of how to obtain Q is to write down a recursive expression that you can then try to solve in order to find the correct Q. How do we go about this? Well, here's again the definition of Q. Here's the definition of the return. And now you can do something funny. You can say, oh, my return is, of course, the immediate reward in the next time step or in the present time step plus gamma times the return for all future time steps. Yeah? Because if I reinsert this into this expression, this extra factor of gamma is just what I need. Um, and then this is actually a correct equation. So little r plus gamma times capital R of the next time step. Insert the definitions, you see this is correct. This is like writing, almost like writing a geometric series in a recursive fashion. Okay, now if I apply the expectation value to the left-hand side, which is giving me Q, or I apply the same expectation value to the right-hand side. Of course, I should get the same thing. It's an equality sign. But now uh, I can simplify it further. I can say, oh, the expectation value of capital R at T plus one. If I follow the policy, then that should be Q at T plus one. But evaluated for which action? Well, for the action that I should take according to my policy, what is this action? Well, it's the one that maximizes Q. 
So I plug in here the state st plus one, which is uh, completely determined once I know the state st and I know the action at that I take. And I still maximize over a because that will be the next step that I take at time t plus one. And so the expectation value of the left hand side again is q at time t. The expectation value of the right hand side has to be the same. And it can again be written in terms of q. And now you see this recursive equation that I promised. Yeah. So left hand side has q, right hand side has q. Of course, as such, it seems again hopeless because it's somehow an implicit equation for this object q that we want to find. But, but now um, you can actually try to bootstrap your way. So whenever you have something like an equation like this, you can say, oh, let me start with a random approximation. I uh, postulate some Q function, uh, maybe some, something very simple, everything is zero or something like this, some stupid uh, approximation. Uh, and then I use this old Q function, I plug it in here, I calculate what I have on the right-hand side, and maybe in this way, I get a little bit closer to the actual Q function. And if I do this many, many times, eventually when it doesn't any longer change, I have my correct Q function. So it's a, the usual fixed point iteration that you can do to solve these equations. And so um, that's actually the update rule. So this is again, this, what is called the Bellman equation. And the update rule would be, you just take your, what is written on the right-hand side, R plus gamma times max Q. Um, and then, you take a little step into this direction. You don't even take a full step, but just a little step, which makes it more stable. Um, so you say, let me take the right-hand side, subtract the left-hand side. That's the difference between right-hand side and left-hand side. Let me take a little step in this direction. That's this factor alpha. It's a small factor. And let me add this little step to my old value. And so step by step, I approach closer and closer, hopefully the correct Q function. If I am finally at the fixed point, if I do fulfill the Bellman equation, then on average over many trajectories, that's uh, the meaning of the expectation value, this first piece is equal to the uh, last piece. So the whole update will be zero. So I am at the fixed point. So nothing changes anymore. So that's nice. So that's the Bellman equation and the update equation. And if we use a neural network to calculate the Q function, because again, our state may be high dimensional and so on. Um, what uh, this means is we use the old, uh, the old incarnation of the neural network to calculate whatever we need for the update. And then we do a little supervised training step. So to make the neural network come closer to the new value. So that's what happens. So take the old neural network, uh, calculate the update, do a little supervised training step to come closer to the new value. Okay. So that's the idea. It's maybe a little bit uh, less straightforward, a little bit slightly more involved than the policy gradient, but um, I hope the idea became clear. And now we can illustrate this. Uh, let's say we started out from Q function completely zero everywhere. And then we just randomly sampled different states or we went through random trajectories, I don't know what. So I, I will remark on this, how we start things and add a little bit of randomness. Uh, but at one point, uh, we will happen to be in this state and we will take, we, we happen to take a step up and we recognize, oh, I get a good reward. So now if I apply this update equation, this will mean that this particular state for this particular action gets an increased Q function because I've recognized if I'm in this location and I go up, I get a good reward. Okay, so this is the first step. So suddenly my quality function has some structure. And now what happens is very nice. Uh, now, if I happen to be in this state and I go up, I see, well, I don't get an instantaneous reward because I don't end up on a state with a box, but I do see that I end up on a square which has a good Q function. This alone is a good thing. So that in the update equation will also be rewarded. And so this square also gets a higher Q value and so on. 
So you see, starting, so to speak, from the end point where I really get an instantaneous reward, uh, my good Q function will spread uh, over everything. And so this is how you should think of the Q function being updated. And I, I was recently reading up on neuroscience, and there's an interesting parallel there. So there's this uh, dopamine. Um, and uh, what happens is the following. So when you have, say, a rat and you give it some food, it, uh, oh, it's rewarded, the dopamine level goes up. Uh, then say you have a lever that the rat has to pull somehow in order to get the food. Yeah? So it pulls the lever, it gets the food, dopamine uh, goes up. But if it does this a few times, then the dopamine uh, goes up even after it has pressed the lever because it understands, oh, the next thing is I get some food, I will be rewarded. Um, and then uh, as time progresses, even if it just comes close to pressing the lever, the dopamine already goes up because it anticipates, oh, I'm going to pull the lever and I'm going to get the food. And then eventually, as this goes on, the, uh, the rise in the dopamine level gets pushed to ever further time, uh, ever, ever, ever previous times. And so eventually, it's just, oh, I'm hanging out in this part of the room where, where there is this lever, and I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling really good. I don't know why. <laughs> so this is what happens there. And this is really quite, uh, quite remarkably consistent with what we are doing here with the Q value. Okay, so now there is uh, one thing about randomness, uh, because also you asked about it. Um, initially, Q is arbitrary, and if we only follow this deterministic strategy of always picking the action with the highest Q value, then, well, we may get stuck in a completely bad strategy. So here we definitely need some randomness in the beginning. And what we can do is very simple. What people do is, um, you throw a dice and with a small probability, you do a random step. And with another probability, you do the step uh, proposed by the Q function. And so this makes sure that at least initially, maybe where this uh, probability epsilon is still uh, greater, you choose it to be greater, um, you can uh, explore all the different possibilities and see many different states, see many different actions, update the Q function, and then eventually, uh, when the Q function becomes better and better, uh, a better and better approximation of the real Q function, maybe you can reduce this epsilon. Okay, so this is one aspect of Q learning. Um, another aspect is experience replay. So if you go in the literature or you look at um, programs, you will encounter this. There will be things like a replay buffer. So what this means is something very simple. So you just store all the states and actions from the past trajectories. And um, instead of fully going through all these trajectories again, playing the game again, or moving the robot again, you just revisit them and you use them to update the Q function. And why this is good is because the Q function, the update rule of the Q function rel relies on the present values of the Q function. But the Q function by now has changed because you have explored so much more. Yeah? You have updated it multiple times. So now the update equation has also changed. So it does pay off to use these old states and actions to update the Q function again, to use the update rule again. So this is how you can uh, reuse uh, things that you did in the past without having to go through them again. And here's, a diff uh, here's an interesting difference with respect to policy gradient. In policy gradient, it's not possible to do the same trick, uh, at least not straightforwardly, to reuse the old states and actions. And the reason is that in policy gradient, the way this works, there's a kind of hidden assumption that we didn't discuss very much, that your states and actions should be distributed according to the current policy. Yeah? That's some of the assumption. And if you were to just indiscriminately use uh, states and actions drawn from such a replay buffer, they would not follow the current probability distribution for the current policy because the policy has changed since that time. And there are uh, ways around it, but at least it's not so straightforward. Okay. Good. So um, here's a famous example of Q-learning, which is actually the Atari video games. Uh, so you have these game screens 
uh, you put in the images as input, actually not only the current uh, image on the screen, but even the last four images, because um, maybe it's important whether the ball is moving to the right or to the left. And uh, you put out the action probabilities. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm describing policy gradient. So uh, you, um, the, the output of the reinforcement learning algorithm is the motion, uh, but it's done, um, but it's done in a Q uh, learning way. So uh, you have the uh, state as the input, and then the Q of S comma A for the different possible actions A that is actually uh, your output. And here's just the motion in the different directions. And so they applied this to various uh, games. And in some of the games, they really achieved a, a superhuman performance. These were typically the games that were more action-like, where you just have to act fast in the right manner. And uh, it's also very interesting to see which games the algorithm had problems with. Uh, these were more the strategy games, where you have to, say, pick up this key and then move to another room and use the key and so on, because then the reward is really very much delayed, and then you need to be smarter. I think by, by now, even these games have been solved, but only with smarter algorithms. Um, here, it was basically directly uh, Q-learning, deep Q-learning applied um, to these games. Here's an example of breakout. So at the beginning, well, this is already after a few training episodes, but uh, the ball um, often does not hit the pedal you know, because the computer is not yet good enough. Now uh, the computer has become good enough to always move the pedal to where the ball is. So the ball doesn't, well, doesn't always get lost. Oopsie. I have to go through this again. And the goal is obviously to, to delete these stones by the ball hitting the stones. You see the high score at the top of the screen. Well, it gets better over time. It will never hit, it will never miss the ball again. And now after 600 episodes, and has discovered quite an amazing strategy. So it builds a little tunnel on the side, and then if it shoots the ball through the tunnel, it will just <laughs> bounce off the wall and really uh, get a lot of points immediately. Okay, so this is quite curious. Um, so this is not so bad. Um, what they then also did is something nice. They visualized the, uh, they visualized what's going on in the neural network. So um, I don't know whether you talked about TSNE, which is, which is one of those visualization methods that try to project down from high dimensional space to low dimensional space. And you can use it, for example, to inspect what happens and say, the last hidden layer of such a neural network, the, which is the neural network that calculates the Q function. And what you want to see is essentially whether this automatically groups together um, states that also as a human, you would say they are somehow conceptually related. And it seemingly does so. So for example, it understands that if you have in the Space Invaders game or whatever it is, if you have a state with many enemy spaceships so at the very beginning, uh, this, is, this is, so to speak, one thing. Uh, if you ha have only one of these enemy spaceships left, that is another kind of uh, situation and so on. Okay. So this was the example of Q-learning. And now I uh, briefly want to discuss uh, something that uh, represents most of the modern approaches. Uh, which combines Q learning and policy gradient. Right? So policy gradient, remember, was about uh, okay stochastic probabilities for different actions. Q learning was about learning how good different actions are and then basing your policy on that. And here you will combine both the approaches. 
um, uh, remember the value function. The value function is just the expectation value of the future return given the current state. And the basic idea of these um, so-called actor critic or more precisely advantage actor critic approaches is this. You learn the value function, I will say how in a moment, and you use it something like a state dependent baseline for the return. So that's at least part of the idea. So what you really do is in policy gradient, replace the return by the following. So here's RT, the future return, but you replace it what by what I display on the right hand side. So this is the current reward, our little RT plus, and then in principle, there would be the sum over all the RT plus one, RT plus two and so on. But this uh, may be very noisy because for each trajectory, it fluctuates heavily. And so you replace it actually by gamma is the discount factor times the value of the next state, which is an estimate that already has averaged over many future trajectories. So it's a less noisy estimate of what's going to happen next. So the first part here is a less noisy estimator of the future return. Yeah. So this alone would help, but then in order to reduce the overall fluctuations even further, we uh, use this baseline idea. Uh, and what we subtract is simply the expectation value of this. So that's, so to speak, the naive baseline, if you want. We subtract the expectation value of uh, the future return, which is, of course, nothing but the value in the current state. So um, this is the future return, but already with a smart replacement, so as to make its fluctuation smaller and you subtract from it the total expected uh, return. The, so the way to interpret this overall uh, formula, uh, you can say like this, um, you can say how much is the return for this particular action that you took above the average. And you can see this even more clearly if you calculate the expectation value of the right-hand side, given the current state and given the current action because the expectation value of the two first terms, given the current state and the, given the current action, is actually the expectation value of the future return given the current state and action, which is nothing but the Q function. And the other part is just the value function. So you're subtracting the value function from the Q function. The Q function tells you what's the expected return for this particular action. The value function just tells you what's the expected return if I follow the best or the current policy action. And so this is called the advantage. What's the advantage if I take this particular action over the average? Okay. So this, uh, this is the starting point, and then you would use this in your policy gradient method simply. But the question then still remains, how do you have access to this value function? And there you want to use something similar like the Bellman update uh, equation for the Q function. There's a similar equation for the value function. And concretely, how to learn this, you use an update rule like this. Let's suppose the network that represents the value function has parameters that I now call mu. And then if you do this update rule displayed here, it actually uh, um, results in trying to fulfill the uh, equivalent Bellman equation for the value function. How can you see this? Well, the, uh, at least intuitively, the right-hand side obviously is zero if the, if the thing in curly brackets is zero. But when is the thing in curly brackets zero? Well, it is zero if the value function at the state st is equal to the first two terms. And the first two terms or the expectation value over the first two terms, that is of course exactly an expression for RT, for the expectation value of the future return, which is what I need for the value function. So you are fulfilling again, this kind of implicit equation that is the Bellman equation for the value function. Okay, so uh, you're doing two things at the same time, learning the value function and doing the policy grading. And so as an added bonus, you can then also play a trick that people like very much. Um, instead of having two different networks, one for the value function and one for the policy, you have one network that takes the state as the input, processes them through many hidden layers, and only in the end, you split it into one branch that gives you the value function as output and another branch uh, that gives you the action probabilities as output. 
And the idea behind that is that maybe there is some interesting structure in the state that should be processed in the beginning that should be useful both for calculating the value function and for calculating the action probabilities. Okay. And so why are these methods called actor critic? Well, the actor is the agent, is the action probabilities, and the critic is, so to speak, the value function. The critic uh, tells me how good this will probably be or how good am I doing if I take this particular action, how good am I doing compared to the average expectation? Okay. And so um, it's hard to keep track of all the acronyms. Uh, people invent uh, modern uh, reinforcement learning uh, methods uh, all the time, several per year probably. Um, some of these um, acronyms standing for modern advantage actor critic methods are these TRPO and PPO. And just as a pro tip, but this is just empirical and maybe it will change in two years. Uh, if I were you and uh, didn't know anything particular about the problem, and just want to pull out of the box a modern reinforcement learning technique, then my first choice at the moment would be PPO. Um, however, I wouldn't uh, recommend to go back to the original paper and look uh, through the tricks and try to implement it uh, yourself. But if you want to use any of these more advanced methods, it's much more straightforward to use one of the available reinforcement learning libraries. And uh, there are several out there. There's a library called uh, Baselines, or Stable Baselines, which is another version, TensorFlow Agents, and many other uh, versions. Some of them work with TensorFlow, some of them work with PyTorch, and uh, you will certainly find something. Uh, the advantage is then if you, if someone comes up with an yet another new crazy reinforcement learning approach, then you don't need to program it by hand. You just if it's available in this library, you just plug it in. And what you have to do then uh, using these modern libraries is just you implement the environment that you need to do. Yeah? So the environment takes the action, does whatever it has to do, I don't know, moves around the robot in the maze, uh, and returns the new state, a representation of the state, as well as the instantaneous reward. So this is the piece you have to program yourself and then you still select some hyperparameters of the reinforcement learning approach, and possibly provide the structure of the neural network for the agent, and that is it. Okay. So now I, I'm very much exactly on time. So I want to summarize uh, by going through again, now that we learned policy gradient, Q learning, and the combination of them, and we saw examples, I want to summarize what are the advantages and the disadvantages of using model-free reinforcement learning in your challenges. Um, so the, one of the advantages is obviously that you can discover feedback strategies. And that is uh, in contrast to say, techniques that have been established very well in quantum control like GRAPE, which is just a gradient ascent technique, but it doesn't do any feedback. It cannot deal with feedback. And uh, that is even more important because feedback strategies are notoriously hard to find. And this becomes clear if you just try to figure out how many there are. So um, imagine that uh, first you have a situation without feedback. So it's just like in a quantum system, just some pulse sequence that you want to prepare a given state starting from the ground state. Um, if we keep for a moment in the domain of discrete actions. Say A is the number of discrete actions you can take at any step, N is the number of steps. So there are A to the N possible strategies, so sequences of actions that you could take. Uh, you take, take this pulse sequence or that pulse sequence, A to the N of them. If you wanted to do an exhaustive search, this is the amount you have to search. With feedback, it's quite a bit worse because for each, for each time step, there may be a different measurement outcome. And depending on these measurement outcomes of which there are M to the N different combinations during the whole time sequence, uh, uh, you, you, can, you have to take different actions according to this. And so it's somehow doubly, growing doubly exponentially. So this is really even worse, so to speak. So uh, reinforcement learning provides you a reasonable method to explore this doubly exponentially large 
space of uh, possible feedback strategies. Then model free. Model free is very important. Um, so first of all, it means you do not always need to adapt your algorithm to the particular situation. Yeah? So there's just one algorithm that you use. Um, and you do not need to say, even if in principle a model exists, you have a feeling that you know the rough Hamiltonian of your quantum device, then you would still need to calibrate it on the device, right? To find out the correct parameters on the device. Um, but there is no need to develop or fit or calibrate such a model or the equations uh, for the dynamics of your quantum device or the world around you. And therefore, it can also learn on real devices with all its imperfections. For example, uh, let's say your model of the device is pretty reasonable. Uh, but uh, let's say there is, of course, the measurement going on. The measurement has some noise. The measurement has some systematic distortions, which you may not easily know. Maybe there are ways complicated ways of calibrating them. But if you apply reinforcement learning, you do not even need to calibrate it because your neural network will implicitly learn all of this. It will learn, yes, if the voltage is too high, it's somehow cut off uh, and so on. It will learn uh, to take into account all of this automatically. So model free is, is really useful, especially for real world examples. Okay. And then finally, of course, you can easily plug in uh, deep neural networks. That's another huge benefit because in particular, you can handle arbitrary observations. We saw you can handle images, videos, measurement sequences of any kind, um, more complicated things. Um, so that's very useful. And you can play around with your network structure and use all the things that are already so useful in supervised learning, you can use here as well. Um, there is one big challenge, I would say, that is you need to see really many, or maybe there are two challenges. So you, first, you need to see really many evolutions. So we are talking about tens of thousands of trajectories you have to go through until you really understand what's going on. Of course, it depends on the particular situation, but that's a ballpark figure. And that makes it, for example, difficult to apply model-free reinforcement learning directly to, say, robots, because <laughs> you don't want to bump into the ball a thousand times until you have finally learned it. Uh, that's not so good. So that is why for robots, often either people use um, planning or model-based reinforcement learning, or maybe they use hybrid approaches, or maybe they simulate it first on the computer, and then they can uh, use this reinforcement learning techniques. And then once you become good in your simulation, uh, maybe then you can go to the real world. So it's, um, it's something to consider here. And then uh, the last point is also something I mentioned already. Um, if you have a situation where there's only one precise sequence of actions that will be the successful sequence of actions and everything else gives you zero reward, uh, then it's extremely difficult. I mean, then even reinforcement learning does not have a smart idea. Then basically all you're left with is brute force search uh, unless you know something special about your problem. Yeah? So you don't uh, need to think that reinforcement learning somehow magically <laughs> knows how to solve such problems. What reinforcement learning is very good at is if you can already find something that is a little bit better than chance, and then uh, you combine this and you get, you modify it, you get even uh, better. Uh, these are the kinds of things that reinforcement learning is good at. Okay. So that um, concludes what I wanted to say here. There's one thing I still want to mention, um, which I didn't mention in the beginning. So if you think about the general goal of general artificial intelligence, yeah, building computers that are really, really intelligent, uh, then of course this will not be solved by supervised learning yeah, because by definition, <laughs> you, you just give question answer pairs that, that's not going to give you general artificial intelligence. So reinforcement learning, or at least the whole concept of reinforcement learning is probably the way to go to uh, finally go to uh, general artificial intelligence. The, the hard task there is to figure out what should be the good reward. Yeah? What should be the good reward? Should it be that you get rewarded when you discover something unexpected, for example, in order to become a good scientist? 
So I think uh, once, once you know there's the reinforcement learning domain and you have all these various approaches with their pros and cons, uh, then it becomes really a question of engineering the good rewards uh, and making them as general as possible. And that's not an easy task in itself, but it's already good that we have at least solved part of the challenge and now we can concentrate on finding out the good rewards. And in this context, then uh, finding out or setting a good reward is similar, of course, to setting a good cost function in the supervised learning case. And this is similar to what in physics means defining your physical model by writing down the Lagrangian or writing down the, writing down the Hamiltonian. So I imagine that eventually there will be something, so let's say in physics, we have the Lagrangian of the standard model. <laughs> and then eventually there will be the reward function uh, that you need to have in order to have general artificial intelligence. Okay, so thank you. So this is it uh, for today. Are there some questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, so you've talked about policy gradient, Q-learning and actual critic. Do you have an intuition on when to use these techniques, like in what different situations we should? Well, uh, so the modern approaches are really uh, typically these actor critic uh, methods. Uh, there are also variants on um, Q learning, uh, various versions. So uh, there is some, uh, one thing that I did not quite talk about is what people call sample efficiency. So, um, how many times do you have to see certain states and try out different actions in order to benefit from them? And there, the idea is that Q-learning is better in that sense because you can have this experience replay, you can reuse the old states and actions. And so then depending on your situation, maybe it's very expensive to run these trajectories. Uh, you want to go more into the direction of Q-learning approaches. Okay, thank you. And can one use Q learning with continuous actions? Q learning with continuous actions? Um, yes, that. Uh, so, so I haven't used it myself out of the box, and I wouldn't be able to give you a reference. But in principle, conceptually, of course, it's uh, possible. You have a Q function that is a function of S and some continuous value of A. The only difficulty then is you still then have to to find the optimal A, which now is a continuous value. So how do you do that? Maybe you do another gradient descent or you do a gradient less optimization method. So, so that's a little bit more tricky then. But you think it's simpler to just change to policy gradient if you have- uh, Yeah, that's at least what I would use. Hi, Nikos, can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the talk. It was uh, really enlightening. Uh, I have a naive question regarding the AlphaGo. Um, so as far as I've understood, the reinforcement learning training is uh, the, the agent plays a game, they try different strategies, and then at the end you tell him uh, either plus one or minus one, you win or lose, for example. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, what would be the, the example of a supervised training that, uh, that you mentioned before that doesn't perform that well? Ah, uh, So uh, supervised training is just, um, you get a reward uh, if you mimic. So, so you're, you're shown a board state S, and then uh, you are asked, uh, what action should you choose? And you will be rewarded if you choose the same action that an expert did in this same situation. And so this is what is expressed here in this update rule. So A is already the action that the expert actually took. And you're trying to increase the likelihood that you are, uh, that, that you are, um, policy also predicts this move. So uh, you can phrase it even if you like as, as reinforcement learning, but that would be an instantaneous reward with a, a very small discount factor. So you have a greedy strategy and the reward is always given if you mimic the expert. Ah, okay, so at each, let's say, uh, at each time step you have to mimic at while the reinforcement step. is in the whole game. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. Ah, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's carry on again and okay. we can go to the So now we have a coffee break. It's it's a bit longer than usual. It's like one hour coffee break. So we are back at uh, twelve. You can use this extra time to to look at the posters and vote. Uh, and yeah, and and today I will also send you the link for the questionnaire regarding the school. We would love if you feel it as well. I know it takes time, but then for us it's a it's a really nice feedback on what to do better and and what was perfect and like we can bask in the, our glory. So please, please feel that. <laughs>